Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar, which is going to be on a crucial topic that resonates across industries. Today, we will be talking about how to address the global skill gap by leveraging training to attract, retain, and grow your workforce. Today's roundtable will be moderated by Michael Rochelle, the Chief Strategy Officer at Brandon Hall Group. As we navigate through the complexities of today's workforce challenges, it's very important to explore innovative strategies and collaborative solutions. So today's panel will include Jeff Walter, the President and CEO at Latitude Learning, Julie Kelly, the Senior Learning Systems Leader at GE Healthcare, TJ Halski, the CEO at Otava, Eddie Hightower Jr., the Senior Vice President, Sustainability and Social Responsibility of Caliber Collision. We want to give a huge thank you to Latitude Learning for sponsoring today's roundtable. Latitude Learning understands the frustrations that come with complex skills-based training programs. Latitude Learning wants you to know that their team is your team tailoring your high impact training programs to be elegantly managed. Please make sure to check out their website and to visit them at latitudelearning.com. If you aren't familiar with the work that we do at Brennan Hall Group, we work with organizations in a variety of ways to inspire and encourage excellence in your HR and HCM practices. We do this in our membership programs and our preferred provider programs for technology providers, as well as our excellence awards. We also have certification programs for individuals and organizations. The last thing we ask is that you engage with us. We encourage you to ask us questions. You can do this by using the question box on your control panel to chat with our presenters. Don't worry if you miss something, we'll be sure to share the link to the recording via email after we conclude along with presentation materials. We also have the chat enabled for today's webinar. So feel free to join in on the discussion today and share your thoughts as we go. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Michael Rochelle. Thank you. Thanks, Shay. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited about having this group of experts together. I think it's uh, just a topic that's on the top of everyone's mind. We were just chatting it up in the uh, official Brand Hall Group green room for our roundtable. Today, we're talking about Jeff was actually sharing with me, he was having a this exact conversation with someone they were sitting next to in a plane suit. It's not a subject that you really have to describe or explain to anyone, whether you're an employee at a, co a company, a leader managing employees or running the company itself. Everyone is trying to figure out job roles, skills, upskilling and reskilling. And what are the new skills that we need from new folks? So you probably remember hopefully you do, when you are registering for this roundtable, that we asked you a series of questions. And so we're going to go through the answers to those questions. And I strongly encourage you to get ready on the chat, ask your follow-up questions. Shay will jump in and make sure that we're able to answer those. But we'll be going through those, and then we'll be getting to like a broader discussion topic where, again, you can pose your comments, questions, things that you'd like to know from the panel. This is your meeting. We want to shape it towards what you came here to know. And with that, I'm going to kind of go through the first question. So we had asked all of you, what percentage of your current job roles require new skills? So basically, the way to read this is that you can see it goes to a 0 to 100% scale. And then the boxes along the middle are the percentage of people that answered what job roles will be touched by new skills. So you can clearly see that a third of companies say about 26 to 50% and about 23% say 51 to 75% and 11% say nearly 100%. So even if you take a look at this, there's very few organizations that are saying there will be no new skills required for current jobs, only 4%. The question is, 
that I think is interesting to open up to the, the panel is, is with so many people weighing in that that many jobs are going to be affected. Current jobs, they require these new skills. That's a big challenge. How do you get that all done in time so that you can meet the needs of the business? So I'm going to turn it over to our team of experts to weigh in on that. So whoever would like to jump in on that first, uh, go right ahead. Well, I'll just uh, jump in, uh, and, and it's it, it, like you said, it is a big challenge. You know, we're um, we're a technology firm, so we see it from a technology standpoint in terms of the skills that our our developers need, but also our analysts. It's it's constantly changing, and so it's you're really, you know, uh, in terms of the current roles, you're you're hoping, you know, that your folks have the uh, fortitude to continually re-educate themselves and provide them with the tools to be able to do that. And then within our clients, uh, we see um, same thing. They're using, you know, we're a learning management system provider and we're, we're seeing that they are constantly changing their uh, training programs to try and uh, adapt to the new skills. And it's a, and it, and it's, it's a huge challenge. There's no silver bullet or magic sauce. Um, but uh, that's, that's, what we've been experiencing. We've been using a lot of technology changes at the company just to try to bridge those gaps and make it more efficient for people. We need to um, really ensure that our, our colleagues are as agile as possible. Time is so precious. And um, if, they, if we're giving them just small increments of time, we have to make sure that they can use that to the best of their ability. So things like our LXP and different training modules in real time. It just, uh, it, it's really made an impact. Hey, TJ, want to weigh in? Yeah, so I, I'm Eddie Hightower. I'm with uh, Caliber Collision. Uh, and so uh, very different from what you might think of as a technology company, but at our core, we really are a technology company. But if you think about modern cars, they really are computers wrapped in steel. And, and so uh, we face this, um, you know, with the increase in technology and, and the more complex repairs that we're doing with vehicles, we're finding the challenge is keeping our technicians up to date on the uh, how to repair a vehicle uh, presents challenges on a daily basis as the manufacturers are changing their standards uh, uh, to repair a vehicle. We have to keep up with that while we're continuing to fix the vehicles that we have in house. And so this uh, presents a ongoing a uh, balancing act for us to say, you know, we need to pull you away from production to do some training that we need you to, in production so that we can pay for that training. And I think that that's a balancing act that uh, we as employers really have to uh, have to address, and it, it is a difficult balancing act. TJ, any thoughts? That's, I think it just echoes more of the same of the group. I think the reality is um, there's a difference between does it require new skills or do you understand that it's just a part of the journey, <laughs> right? Like, and so the reality is that you could pick an industry and tell me a trade. And if you don't acknowledge that evolution requires skill improvement, um, the, the role will outgrow you. And so whether it's in today's economy of asking, you know, fewer people to do more work. So you're broadening their skill demand as a result of just how you're managing within this economy. Or if you're taking, you know, you know, evolving the new work, right? Human augmentation, AI, and, and a lot of things that are shifting the technical landscape, it's there. So uh, for us, we see of 100% of our roles, 100% requirement to skill up and continue to learn. And really our responsibility as an employer is to create and facilitate the opportunity for them to do it, um, to encourage it. You know, you can lead them, lead them down the path, but you can't make them do it, right? So. Uh, we're certainly working really hard to encourage them and show them that we support them through tools and resources and investment. So, Does, do the numbers surprise any of you? Did you think were you surprised by such a high percentage of reskilling needed? Yeah, yeah, yes, no, and it, it kind of goes to something we were talking about earlier about what do you call the people that work in your organization? And in some cases, like Julie was saying, they're you know, you're changing the nomenclature to better reflect the relationship that and then what those folks do. And in other cases, you're using the same title you used 20 years ago, but it's a completely different job. And so it's so so it's like a little yes or no, uh, is in my, my the way I look at it. 
Anyone else surprised by the numbers? I said, ah, I thought it'd be higher. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. I, I think I know where we fall. Oops. Jeff, I, I think it is, uh, in, in Julie, it's very much uh, what we considered an, an automotive repair technician even a, a decade ago, the much different job than what they're performing today with the advances in technology and tools. Uh, and again, as I, I pointed out, the changes in the vehicles themselves, the complexity of the repairs, uh, and just the pressures uh, that, that we're under from a production uh, perspective. I mean, it's no secret that insurance rates are rising and, and part of it that we'll be talking about in this is you know, the, the skills gap, but also the lack of trained uh, people to do the jobs. Uh, and so there's a lot of pressures and a lot of things are impacting all of us. Uh, and, and I would just say in, in the auto, wow. if you drive a vehicle, you're being impacted by what's happening in our space. Uh, and you're probably seeing it in the in various spaces like healthcare and, and other areas as well, is that we're all being impacted by what's happening out there in the lack of skilled trade professionals and how you keep them skilled and how you continue to reskill them and upskill them and handle uh, all of the pressures that we're all dealing with. Let's take a look at what folks said about new roles. So let's see what, what that, and I just wanna let everyone know that we didn't take the same bar from current roles to make it hiring roles. A lot of people say, wait a second, what changed actually? It actually changed, but it's literally a blueprint of what we're expecting from hiring job roles versus folks that are current. We still have that, that middle area of well over 60% of organizations as a midpoint are saying that 50% of the hiring job roles require new skills. This is particularly complicated, I, I think. So I'm gonna riff on this a bit and then everyone can jump in. Think about what you're saying. You're hiring someone because you wanna bring new skill sets into the organization. At least that's a, we hope that's one of the reasons why. But you're already saying, while I'm hiring you with your net new skills, you're also gonna need new skills on top of that. So the person's been here five minutes and they already have to learn something net new. It's like, it sounds like anti-gravity pain, but it's, it's really true. So how do we kind of go back to what we just said and say, now you're bringing in new people are supposed to bring in the fresh skills, but we're saying the exact same number of people, we're already recognizing them at the time of hire that we have to retool them. That puts a lot of pressure on the onboarding phase, don't you think? I think what it creates an interesting, I appreciate what you're saying, Michael, I think you're spot on, but I think it's creating a new dilemma that folks are really struggling with. And we're seeing it particularly in like our people and culture group. And that is assessing current market value of those skills. Right. Because the landscape shifting so fast that for folks that you're hiring, they're either, they might not be aligned in terms of an education that they worked really hard to achieve. And it made a lot of sense in that point in time. HBR just released their article again, reshifting that you're seeing the market shift towards skill base first, education second. So you're watching this big trend happen. And so now you have this either under oversizing and market when you're bringing resources in of how much do I pay you based on what you do, what you can't do, what we need to invest in you to get you to where you're going to be. Um, and so it's making it really hard to identify what do we as a business really need if it's a moving target. Um, and, and so that's, it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I think hiring right now is challenging because you're trying to fit round pegs and square holes sometimes and highly talented people, but the jobs themselves are a moving target uh, for the, for the demands because of the rate of technology release right now uh, and the adoption that we're seeing, particularly in our space, customers are taking on new technologies that they themselves can't service and support. So their expectation is they're gonna push it to the third party and they can, third parties have the same risk. It's just amplified, you know, three or four X, right? Cause they're servicing multiple customers. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Julie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point this to you. So you probably have arguably one of the most diverse hiring needs out there as an organization. Does this surprise you at all? Or is this what you're facing every day? It is what we're facing every day. And, you know, we've we've tried to come combat this from a number of different places. Culturally, we've tried to shift the culture. We've tried to shift the timelines and give us more runway for the 
um, recruiting and the hiring to try to get the right talent in place rather than just trying to fill spots. But then we also have to extend the runway out to allow for that upskilling, even though they are coming in skilled. And that slows down so many other pieces. And we, we are trying to do that while keeping the culture as strong as possible so that there's um, not the impact to, to as your point, um, you know, they're coming in very well skilled and then I'm telling them, but you don't know enough, you have to learn X, Y, Z. And that can, that can have an impact on their, their motivation, right? So trying to find all these balances from a colleague perspective, a leader perspective, and then flowing that out across the, the a global market like our company is, it's, um, it's a challenge, but it's a balancing act. Yeah, it's interesting. I just want to let you know yeah, that uh, you've got Casey out there feels your pain that's in a related <laughs> market, building oh. side by sides, companions, and eight, ATVs. And Denise brought up something interesting, and I was hoping that maybe uh, you can address this is with, with what TJ said. With this moving target of skill sets, ontology, what people, how do you know how to pay people? Like they're not even arriving with everything you need them to do. So how, you know, like it's just, it has, it has so many tethers to it. And how do you even deal with that in the hiring stage? Um, HR is our best friend. So, <laughs> you know, they, um, they do a lot of market research. And in all honesty, the candidates will come to us with a number in mind and uh, they'll broach that. And it's a negotiation based on you know, the normal things, budget, finance, market um, need. And then just continue to make sure that the company benefits and the culture itself is what's drawing them in. It can't just be about the numbers Otherwise they just job hop, right? So we have to really continue to make it a culture that they want to stay for. Otherwise we're spending way too much money on training for other companies. We train them and then they move on. We, we, we wow. That, so. I, I love that. I think I'm going to have to steal that. You're training <laughs> for other people. You know, Marianne is also saying the same thing. It's that you just got to go for that trust fall and that people will be up for the challenge to, to, to learn it, but Jeff, I'm going to bring it back to you for a second, since you're the technology guru right here. <laughs> is uh, what role do you think tech plays? Like, is it a, is it to, not necessarily like you can't solve the, the gap, right? But does technology allow you to scale it quicker? Is it does it allow you to get to more people faster? Does it allow you to do? more personalized approaches to make it more effective? Is it all of the above? Like what, what role does tech play? Well, I, I, I think it's all of the above. And I think as TJ was saying, and, and Julie, you know, you're, you're hiring a different, you're looking for a different set of characteristics than you did say 20 years ago, right? You're looking mm -hmm. at people that can learn, people that are comfortable with uncertainty, uh, people that, and, and I, I love what you said, Julie, with the culture, you know, we, we found, you know, it's, it, it, you want to promote the culture. Are they a good fit for the culture? Is it a learning culture? Is it a, is it a journey culture? Like TJ was saying, where you're coming in and you're, it's part of your career journey. And, and then that's the one piece of it. And then technologically, you know, uh, tech, you know, technology is driving a lot of this because things are happening better, faster, quicker. And, and guys like me spent, you know, their entire careers building stuff to make life easier for folks so that folks can do more. But then that raises the bar and changes the, the skill sets. And um, I want to also comment on something else. And it's a technological thing, but not from an information technology perspective. And that's, um, you know, another thing we've seen, and I love, you know, Eddie and, and, and Julie uh, to comment on it. But in terms of on that hiring process, you know, uh, I'm old enough to remember that, you know, certain schools were, you know, or certain companies recruited at certain schools and that, and that certificate meant something and, and, and got you a, you know, an open door to certain industries and certain things. And it seems to me that as this whole thing is changing to the skills and that, that I don't want to say the diplomas or the certificates are, they just don't seem as important as differentiating because they're kind of like 
certifying you on a certain dimension, but there's this whole other dimension of mm -hmm. behaviors that are necessary to be successful in organizations that the correlation is not there like it used to be, I, I think. So it's very, very interesting to see not only how companies are trying to reskill folks and upskill folks and bring in and, and all the things we've already talked about, but then there's the large, there's also a larger societal issue of, well, all these institutions that provided these uh, these accreditations in the past, you know, the, the validity of those accreditations are being, or the appropriate, the validity is the wrong term. The, the correlation of those uh, credentials to being successful at company X is being called into question. And, and because there's a whole new set of behaviors that are necessary to be successful at a, at, at a given company. So it's a very, it's very interesting. I, and I think Pam from the audience said something that is very powerful, which is if you have a culture of lifelong continuous learning, then, you know, this whole skill gaps thing isn't a gap anymore. It's just a natural evolution of you can't know everything you need to know at the moment that you need to know it because the organization and, and everyone included on this call, you know, the organization doesn't stand still to allow people to catch up. It's always going to be this stretch, right? It's like the slinky effect. So we can't, I, I would say that, you know, we can't call it a gap. Can we? It's just the nature of how business takes place. And we, we're in a perpetual upskilling and, and reskilling of individuals. So good comment there, Pim. I just well, let, Michael, go you, ahead, Daddy. Comment on a couple of things I thought was really great that, that Jeff brought in about the, the technology and, and the impact. We've been talking a little bit about that. So one of the things that we're being very deliberate about at, at Caliber, especially given our size, and we have 31,000 teammates plus uh, in 41 states across the United States, uh, and so we're of the size now that what is really important to us is developing those relationships with the people who are making those decisions at the automotive maker level uh, and the technology level, like with the advanced uh, driver assistance systems level. We're developing those technologies of being very close to them as they're developing these technologies so we're not surprised. Right. And so uh, we partner, uh, it's by design, we partner very closely with them as they're developing new technologies. To develop <laughs> right. Right. Know when it's coming before it's coming. <laughs> right. For them, right. As well. Not only one other thing is that one, what we're doing on the back end too is that we've developed systems where we can actually send the work that needs to be done to the right skilled labor. Uh, and if you think about our approach to how we uh, how we work at Caliber, is you probably notice if you're, especially if you're in a big city like Los Angeles or Dallas. We don't just have one center, we have 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 centers in one area. And we've developed the technology in-house now where we know what the specialties are from who really down to the technician level has the skill sets to do the work on a particular vehicle when they are certified to do the work on that vehicle and that they have the capacity, the time to do that work efficiently on their team. So we can do what we call load leveling where we can take a vehicle and we drop it off at one of our centers, we may move it to another center that you don't know where the work is actually done and we move it back to the center for delivery. But that's an example of, I think you really have to attack this from the, both of those ends, which is you know talking to the technology, you know being on top of, of those relationships before it's done to you. And then the other piece is thinking about how do you take the work to the people who can do that work now while you're maybe upskilling others to doing that work, bringing in others in line. So those are those are some things that we're doing at Caliber to, to kind of address it from both ends. All good points. So let's continue the journey. Let's go to our, our next question. So here we are, the big negatively impacting, dun, 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 you know, the doomsday question, right? Where is the skills gap negatively impact the organization? Resoundingly, employee retention, which was also brought up by our audience. I think it's safe to say, let's put a stake in the ground and call it what it is, that learning is the new retention tool for many organizations. I think we can safely say that, and we need to get it up to that level of strategic significance. But what was really great is we also asked business-minded approaches. So we've got employee retention, 
But then we wanted to kind of get a feel for what this is doing to the top and bottom line and the middle numbers in the new organization. And, and we still got really good numbers here that, you know, customer satisfaction, almost half the organizations feel like if I don't have the properly skilled people, you know, I'm going to fail. It's going to negatively impact my customer satisfaction, potentially again, you know, increase my risk profile. A third of organizations that's directly attributable to to revenue and a similar group to to profit. So it seems like that we have a very good understanding of the negative aspects of learning, which is we don't do it right. We don't skill people properly, get the right person in the right place doing the right thing the right way. Then it's gonna it's gonna impact the organization. Surprises here. Do you think that this is really the tail of the tape for your organizations as well? Turn it over to everyone to weigh in. Yeah, I think so. I think I think the, the big challenge you know, when I took over here at Otava, it was a cultural shift. Like, you know, first, if you look generationally just in organizations and kind of where we are in eras broken out, first, the organization has to adopt like you owe what you know, right? So for those that have been in this industry a long time, the job is learning compression, right? You're trying to help those coming up uh, behind you in experience to have the right access to do the right things because you've set the right vision. And what is it? Peter Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I kind of laugh when folks will they'll, they'll, they'll kind of try to out strategize the core responsibility, which is people first. And I think you're looking at it, employee retention and customer satisfaction, right? The more competency that you create for an employee, the more confidence that you create more confidence you create, the better your customer experience. As long as you're creating a culture that is not damning somebody for not learning fast enough and yet equally holding somebody accountable through clarity of what the expectations are for success, right? And if you build that kind of a culture that champions that success of the hard work that they're doing, and it's not just lip service, you carve out the opportunity for them to learn, you make the investments, you provide the tools, you demonstrate how to get to the outcomes, you can expect people to win instead of setting them up to fail. Right. And I would argue that I think it's a bigger hit on revenue than it's forecasted here. I think whether it's revenue protection or if it's top line growth, it's going to show up in customer satisfaction first, it's going to show up in ENPS, which is going to precede your, your, your customer satisfaction scores. And then the rest kind of trails off. That's at least what we've seen here at Otava. That's a really, that's a really good point. If, if these were the numbers that you brought to your organization, the panel I'm asking, uh, are, these the, are these the right numbers to be talking about? Happen to be the ones that we asked about. Do you think there's something, another bar that's missing from this equation that you would bring up to your team about how the skills gap is negatively impacting? It, yeah, I, I would just raise something. Uh, really interesting and you can go online and download it the uh, 2023 uh, world economic forum um future jobs report where they were asking all the you know global 1000 companies and you know julie thank you you're you're, you're in there well not you personally but uh, ge and um the number one barrier to growth that was mentioned was the uh skills gap in the local labor market and the number two well, uh which was about 60% of the, of the respondents. And the number two uh, barrier to growth was the inability to attract talent. So I would agree with uh, TJ. Uh, you know, I think the, the proximal cause is the employee retention, right? It's, it's they're, they're, they're unhappy and they're going elsewhere. But really the, the underlying root danger is, um, is future growth and when we're seeing that you know that's just last year's report from world economic forum and then to, you know to comment on something eddie said earlier uh, i was giving a, a a talk over at the uh associate uh the automotive technology automotive technician managers council and uh, we were pulling some data on, on automotive technicians and when we talk about the gap it's the number of people that have certain skills you know everybody's career is a journey but but it's the aggregate. And do you have enough skills in an industry? And, and at the uh, ATMC, um, you were pulling data from some studies and every year uh, the industry that Eddie's a part of needs about 110,000 new 
uh, auto techs in the in the U.S. and our vocational schools are pumping out about twenty six thousand. That's the you know it's just that's the gap. So anyway, not to take up too much time, but I, I think that the the future growth and revenue is underrepresented here. And I think this is it looks to me so this is a little surprising to me, but I think it's more of the prox the immediate fire that people are feeling. And if you don't fix that fire, it's going to it's going to burn down the house type of thing. I, I, I thanks for thanks for depressing me, John. Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, but just building on that a little bit and, and building a little bit on what TJ said as well is that we we definitely feel that uh, particularly in our industry, uh, which I'll talk about and what we're doing about it. But I I agree it's the revenue and, and it's the it's actually the missed revenue. Uh, you know, for us, it's the right. market that we're not able to meet because there's the demand there for the work that we do. And if you've had a, a car in one of our facilities lately, you're, you'll notice that the cycle time is up. That means it's taking longer for your car to be repaired because there's a lack of skilled technicians to do the work for the reasons that Jeff just stated. And you're seeing that across the board, the skilled technicians across the board. And, and there are a lot of fundamental reasons for that. And it, it's people, you know, the grain of the workforce, the lack of people entering the workforce, all of those things. Uh, and, and we definitely see it. Uh, you know, I think it is light on the revenue number here and the, and the potential market, uh, addressable market is, is the way we look at it. And that's why we have developed our own technician apprentice training program uh, where we are outside of the schools, which we view as partners. We, we love that. They're a source for people to come into our industry that we developed uh, in 2022, our own technician apprentice training program called TAP, where we're graduating now, we're on a run rate of about uh, 1,500 trained technicians a year that we are training and putting into the industry. Uh, but that's an example of the kinds and scale of what I think employers are going to need to do, especially in skilled technical areas. This is how we're gonna have to solve this, this opportunity. Uh, so, uh, it up as a uh, and Jeff again. Thanks for kicking me when I'm down, but uh, you know it, it's a it's a start. <laughs> it's it's just an opportunity. <laughs> it's a great opportunity for us. Yeah, Julie, I'm going to leave you with the uh, the final point. What if I said to you, based on an organization as big as yours, that there should be a bar all by itself for productivity? Oh, I think that goes without saying for sure. Um, when I, I, I've I've seen an ebb and flow over the years, right? Sometimes we were very flush with um, skilled individuals and then it sort of ebbs and then it flows again. Um, and the productivity itself, nowadays things change so quickly. Technology changes so quickly. So the skills that are needed, it, it, it just takes so much to stay on top of it. And when you can't work efficiently, when you can't learn, work with a lean mindset, Productivity does take a hit, and that impacts impacts everything downstream and upstream. And people tend to only look one directional and very myopically. So when you when impact when productivity is impacted, and it affects the downstream um, risks, it affects revenue, it affects the profits, everything down. But it also affects the customer satisfaction. It affects employee retention. It, it impacts every aspect of it because of the feelings that go along with it and the business impact, the global impact, the customer impact, the product impact, all of it. You know, I, I throw that out because uh, an employee engagement, Amanda's saying too, that we should add is there were several folks that were talking in the chat about putting employees in a position to win. And that's what made me think of the productivity piece is that we're thinking about, you know, boo-hoo, how it affects us as organizations. Imagine how your employees feel where they can feel the gap because they know what you're asking of them. Right. And, so, and they're under that, you know, I want to be yeah. as productive and maximize my opportunity here at the organization. And you're already telling me that, you know, I'm starting from behind the starting line as far as knowing yeah. how to get that done. It's a real challenge. So one of the things I try to really do, um, one of the first meetings I have with a new employee after they've onboarded is unfortunately I sit down and I say, okay, now tell me what you want your next role to be. Right. Um, and they're, they're just starting this one, but 
as I explain it to them, it takes so long once we've done that skills gap analysis to fill those skills for your next role. If you're in a role two or three years, we can use that time to continue to build your skills and to build on that foundation and those pyramids. And by engaging them right out of the gate, it helps them manage that balance for when I'm asking more than I necessarily should be. Exactly. So let's tackle the next question. Okay. I don't think the slide is advanced. Not on my screen. We may be having a, a technical problem being able to advance the slide. Oh, our team, I think, is taking it down and restarting. While we're doing this, it's been interesting watching the, the chat and the flow. I think people are really engaged on the idea that this is a topic of, of real importance and there's so many different places where they're spreading out, you know, in the conversation. Um, oh, we have a little bit of a technical problem where we're actually broadcasting from. So we'll be back on with the slides in a second. But I wanted to ask a group in form. We would have gotten to this um, later on. It gives, and Jeff, I'm going to throw this back out to you because I want to kind of keep that thread in the back of people's mind about technology. So everyone probably on this call has some form of learning technology in the building, right? Mm -hmm. And, or they may have multiple instances of the, of the technology. When we begin to think about how to be able to scale and address everything that we've talked about so far, what role does technology, and here we are back, what, let's just finish a point, but yeah, does, I, I don't think we're talking enough about technology, Jeff, with this, how it can help with the underpinning of all of these complexities that we're, you know, that we're bringing up. And the reason I'm bringing up, great segue to the next slide is, when we talked about this in our practice call yesterday, is everyone put the usual suspects up there. You know, I don't have enough budget to do this. I don't know if I have enough training staff capabilities. You know, scaling is an issue or a big company or diversely geographic regions don't have enough time. Technology kind of slides off. And I, I just find that, why isn't that like the number one thing that you would want to make sure that you had? Well, I, I, I think this slide really surprised me. And I've been in the ed tech space for about 20 years now. And uh, my, my background was, uh, I was a developer way back in the day. You, you don't want me to develop anything, but I'm kind of that type of background. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I look at this and it's interesting and an opportunity for organizations like us that are perform that are in the technology space because Technology basically makes everything, I mean, the point of technology is to make things better, faster, cheaper at scale. And so I, I look at this and it's like, oh, the problems are better staff training, cheaper on the budget, faster with the time and scaling across the organization. But there's a feeling that, you know, the technology is not a barrier. And I think it goes to the, the skills. And I, I've used this analogy a lot of times. You know, to me, skills is the ability to do something versus know something. And, and, and the analogy I always use is like, is it's, it's getting your, like getting your driver's license. You know, there's passing the written test and then there's passing the road test. And I think we as an industry, you know, the, the learning technology industry and, and our practitioners uh, on the, in, the, in the training area, but then an excellent, excellent job in the last couple of decades in terms of creating technologies that enable people to learn and acquire knowledge better, faster, cheaper. But skills are about practicing something so that you become proficient and having coaching to help you, you know, on the way. And I think as a, as a, as an industry, and I'm just I'm talking about the, the technology side of things. 
you know, we've, I, you know, I, I, you know, I like to say our product has some things in it that allows you to do that. But as an industry, we really are, are kind of, you know, maybe in, at, at the newbie level there in terms of really helping uh, folks develop skills. And like I said, to me, skills is the ability to do something. And to be able to do that, you first have to know what it is, and then you have to practice it, and you have to have a coach, or you have to be coached on it. And and the, the technology, I, I, I just view that, and and some of the things from the conference last week with AI, uh, you know, or but it doesn't even have to be AI. We just, it's just not something we've done very well, uh, quite frankly. Um, I don't know if my colleagues in the industry would say that they'd probably put a better sales spin on it, but I have the unfortunate predisposition of being brutally honest. <laughs> So you know, I, think, no, I think you did a great, I think you did a great job, Jeff. I think what's happened is we went from an era of, you know, lack of information readily available. So now we have information everywhere with a lack of wisdom, right? So you're watching this really interesting phenomenon happen right now where we don't have an, I think technology, it's, it's almost overserved in mm -hmm. the sense that we're putting multiple platforms on top of multiple platforms and creating access to everything without clarity of what's most important. And we're, we're dismissing, if you look, you know, it's kind of like a crock pot versus a microwave analogy. You know, today, if you look, we create these natural expectations that because of the technology rate of release versus the rate of adoption, our expectation on an employee is, Hey, welcome to year one. You need to have 10 years in seat experience. Right. And we even, even see that in the hiring process where it's like, Hey, you know, we really want you to have a degree, you know, maybe an MBA, now maybe even a PhD. We'd also like you to have 10 years of experience and you're 25 years old. Like there's a whole lot of like, we have to reset the expectation, which is, hey, listen, if you come here, we can help chart plot out what time and seat, to your point, the actual driver's test is going to take to be proficient. We can make you productive, but we can't make you proficient overnight. Proficiency is going to take time and seat. And so to Julie's point earlier, it's we have to do the job as leaders to slow down long enough to say, let's be practical. This is a three to a five year journey. We can put the right technology platforms in place to help you be successful. We can chart plot out a career and a compensation growth plan that says, if you do, you get, and it's going to look like this over three to five. Right. But for whatever reason, we we struggle with the social ability to have a real direct conversation with somebody and say, hey, you're going to suck at this for a little while. You're just going to suck less three years from now. And if we could really help articulate that and marry the technology to it, you would watch people thrive. But in Seth, we're like kind of afraid that we want to recruit people in. So it's like, well, come in, you're going to do great. We'll help you get there. We're not going to tell you it's going to take like five years to really be proficient. And then you get frustrated. And then the organization spends a whole lot of money to Julie's point either in this, this like cycle of violence. It just could continue to perpetuate. So I think you hit the nail on the head. Like it, it was a really great point that you made. Well, so let's go to the next slide. Now, I want the audience to kind of frame this for a second, right? We said 36% of people, this is, these are your stats. 36% said, eh, technology is a constraint. Maybe this slide tells us why. And when we were going over this yesterday, the results. One, two, three, the first three, the, that are listed up there and your approaches to closing these skills can be done without the scrap of technology mm -hmm. involved. So is it that the constraint is perceived as less than the other things because we're gonna go back and try to close the gap with things that aren't technologically enabled like buddying people up on the job or going back to apprenticeship, getting someone that you know, peer to peer, getting together, sitting in a classroom, you know, or on a, a virtual instructor-led training on video conference, low bar attack, and pretty much, you know, telling people what they, they need to know. It's interesting that the top three kind of lead to why me people might have a blind spot or a white space on tech not being as nearly as big a constraint. Whereas if you look below that, we plan on attacking these skills with, with primarily less technology than you would think. You know, 65% is a pretty low number for even delivering courses, say, through an LMS like Latitude, mm -hmm. or being able to offer coaching and mentoring, which has been brought up by the audience several times. 
webinars, podcasts, things like we're doing right now, videos, and then even simulations and games, which is total immersive learning, 100% ubiquitous technologically. We're putting that down on the lower level of the attack plan for closing the gap. So it seems to me that maybe people, you know, in the audience that we can spend some time is to say, maybe we need to flip the script on this and say the things that are at the bottom of this chart that are technologically enabled really is the answer. And if you don't have a good tech stack involved, do you really believe that you can do the first three and be scalable, get to everybody in time, make sure everyone learns things at the speed of the business? That's where I'm coming out. Turn it over to the panel to weigh in. No, so I would just say on the technology side, why why I read that that slide and I said, well, it, it really is not, <clears throat> uh, you know, we got that piece. We have it. And we see it as supportive of the rest of the training that we have to do. And, and I saw the comment that came in that talked about the, you know, uh, showing someone how to do something in a, in a video or a simulation or, or, or teaching them the theory behind it by attending an online course. But giving them the hands-on experience for our line of work and what they're doing is there is no substitute for that. Uh, is that they have to be able to turn the wrench. They have to be able to do the well. They have to be able to do these very physical jobs uh, and to uh, have that experience. It, that is our learning to drive the car. It's learning to fix the car uh, in, in our line of work. And there, there are simulations that get you so far. There is theory that gets you so far. But without the on-the-job training component of it, you cannot demonstrate the competency that helps us achieve our number one outcome, which is to deliver safe repairs done in a safe way. And so that's where I look at it is that I feel like the technology, we got it. I mean, it's there. It's almost table stakes that you know that you have to have, that you have to be able to deploy those learning modules that way. And even our technician apprenticeship program contains those elements. It has the on the job training, which is turning the wrench component, but it's supplemented with the online learning component. And so we have those two married and you got to do both. You got to do both. So that's why I looked at that slide and I said, now technology is not the inhibitor anymore. We can deploy that across to our, you know, 3000 people in our training program. We got that. And, and so that's why I viewed that as a more hopeful uh, of saying technology is no longer the inhibitor. It used to be of, you know, the, the expense and the, uh, and, and the really how do you deploy this, how do people, I mean, it was really, you know, here, here's your classroom. Uh, that's how we view it for our technicians out there. Yeah. I love the counterpoint on that. Julie, Jeff, TJ, well, what are your points of view? Well, I I look at it as a huge opportunity um, when I see that the top, again, it goes back to, you know, developing skills is practice and coaching. And so, Eddie, you're, 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 you're spot on. You know, some of it, you've got to put your hands on things and you got to perform, but how can that? How can you have that technology enabled, not replaced, but enabled? And you know, uh, Michael, uh, like, uh, like, and a perfect example is what Marriott Bonvoy was doing uh, th th that session last week, where they they took a traditional three day instructor led training program where everybody would fly in and you know classroom based instruction, and they broke it up over multiple weeks. Same content, but now it was via Zoom. And it was, we do a module, and then you go back to your hotel and you practice that behavior. And then you come back to the cohort two weeks later. We talk about that. You get some coaching from each other, teach a new behavior, go back out and practice. And it, it you know, that to me, that was a technology enabled, you know, hands on. You got to, you got to practice, but, you know, in, in that, but not just on a job and not just, you know, from your buddy, but the, these people were learning and practicing and getting coaching from peers and 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 coaches across this you know global conglomerate. So it's pretty, it's a pretty interesting way of doing that. So, it's just so mm -hmm. and then you know, there's other text coming down a pipe that's kind of interesting too. But that's all set for now. Yeah, we we love to use our training and our ongoing training back to kind of what Julie was, I, I think, talking about of where do you want to go and how do we make them more efficient, help you get there, is we include our uh, our kind of like our career, where can you take this job? Where where do you start? Where can you go with this? But we also talk to our recruits and our technicians about our continued investment in their education training because 
of all of the things we talked about, the evolution of technology, evolution in our cars, evolution in, in, in everything that's coming our way, is that we spend a lot of money every year to keep our technicians up to date uh, on everything they need to know so they can be more efficient because in our business, if you don't know how our technicians are paid, that you really kill what you, you really eat what you kill. And so at the end of the week, you start with zero. At the end of the week, you're rewarded for the hours and it's based on your efficiency. How efficient were you in doing those jobs? And if we are not continuing to upskill you and reskill you and teach you these new uh, techniques and new technologies and provide you with, with those, those, uh, those opportunities, then we're, we're failing you as an employer, which goes way back to that slide we were talking about retention. Right. But that's got to be a differentiator for us. You use this as a differentiator in uh, trying to attract talent and then retain talent. And you've got to then, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You got to deliver on it. For sure. Julie, you want to give your perspective? <laughs> I'll answer. Uh, I'm actually going to piggyback a little bit on what Jeff said because historically, um, larger corporations, at least that's what I have experience with, right, has um, focused historically on building the leadership pipeline, uh, making sure that the monies were spent on upskilling and really making sure that the leadership had the skills yep. that they wanted. And all that is shifting now. What I've seen, and um, Jeff sort of um, mentioned that Mara Bonvoy was, had done something. I've seen a lot of the bigger companies doing something similar where they're taking those, um, it used to be very um, sought after trainings that you had to be nominated for at a company in order to get to take these trainings. And they're taking them and they're breaking them down and they're using current technology to deliver them to a wider audience within the company um, in a different way and really allowing the entire population of the company to benefit from these, these trainings and these skills. And it, it, balances the, it balances not only the playing field, but it improves the culture and the, the benefits, and it's all from utilizing the current technological changes that we have at our fingertips right now. I think that's a great point, Julie. To piggyback on that, one, one thing I see that's struggling, this chart makes a lot of sense to me. I see what Jeff's seeing an opportunity. I'm, a, I'm in tech, right? So I get excited about this. <laughs> but I, I would summarize that sometimes when we reach a point of struggle, we try to solve a new problem in old way, right? It's superhuman for us to reach back and go, this worked in the past. Let's just do this again. And I, I often hear people, they decouple education, training, and enablement. You can't do one without the other two. And if you don't do them in the right order, you just pump a whole lot of information into your organization and you never get to a state that the training creates enablement, which improves proficiency. And now you start to get the productivity versus the activity out of your resources. And that translates to your P&L report, right? But when when you look at this, what's happened, I even see organizations struggling where they're taking a HR department, rebranding it a people and culture department, and then dropping on top of them, hey, good luck, go ahead and train and organize the whole business. Well, that department is not your training department. And so can it be involved in curating culture and improving? You absolutely want that. But in order for this to be done well, this is a, this is a behavior change of, at a culture level. Like... The, at the end of the day, this is culture. You have to start with what are you as a business committing to from what training and education is going to re require in your particular market segment to be impactful. So in automotive, it's interesting to see some of the comments coming in here is that in side, side by sides and ATVs and that industry, the rate of distance, the compression between a full automobile sitting on the highway and a side-by-side -side today is not that far apart anymore. This the gap between the two and the skill demand is just the same, but the education, you know, is 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 almost similar. So I think we're seeing that we have to get better as about not just providing technology, but how to marry that to education, training, and enablement to put a full system together to help an entire organization from leadership to utility levels know how to embrace that and roll that out and and duplicate that. So um, and technology is the only way you can do that at scale. And like like it or not, it it's coming. <laughs> like it's it, it's accelerating on release. So I hope you get comfortable with it. Um, but that's that's where I think you're going to have great opportunity. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just going to comment on on something TJ said just at now and 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 earlier. Uh, and it's the the cult. I mean, 
I get all excited about technology, so that's just me. I'm weird that way. But the culture is really, really important. And and you said something earlier, and and it's and again, this is something that's different for us, I think, for societal than it has been in the past. And skills are different than knowledge. And skills are about being able to do something. And when you start doing it, you're terrible at it. Absolutely terrible. And and you know, from a societal standpoint, our academic institutions are built on knowledge-based training. And, you know, there's a whole culture of kids coming out of the schools today that are so afraid to fail at anything. They're, they're just, they, they're so afraid to be bad at something because the bars have been set for their entire 22 years of existence or 18 years, depending on where they're exiting the, the 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 institutions and uh that they that not to fail at something and and, and skill <laughs> development is about failure <laughs> there's no way around that and the only way you <laughs> overcome right. that is culturally so that's I'm sorry. right 100 you know and, Ju and julie said the same thing you're over there yeah. okay so the same thing uh sim you're very similar you know it's it's you got to get that culture right that you know you come in you just got this new job and it's like, okay, great. Well, half of what you need to know, you don't know how to do. And now let's talk about the next job you want anyway. And yeah, it's just a completely different mindset than than we're than we're developing the pipeline of future uh, employees from the from the K twelve through the university. So, but yeah. Good excellent. Stuff. Let's let's frame up and wrap up. So we'll go to our last slide. So I'm going to just have, I'm going to kind of frame this up and then we'll just go real quick on, on your, your closing thoughts. These are the things that I hope everyone found that we covered during our, what, what could have been a three hour round table. And thanks to you and the audience for stoking the fire and taking sides and really getting, I think the best out of this team of experts. I certainly learned a lot. I, and now I'm thinking that we need a part two to the epiphany around is technology the learning mode or is technology the, the mode in which we learn? So that's, that's <laughs> uh, now we have to look at it as we're not trying to replace coaching and mentoring with tech, but is there a technologically enabled coaching and mentoring approach, art imitating life? So we'll have to plan that as a part two for everyone. But looking at this, you know, I, I'd really like to just start with Julie for closing comments on this. You know, where does this land us in terms of where we started, which is trying to close the skills gap? What are your closing thoughts? Yeah, so from what I heard here and what I've been feeling, right, um, trying to marry culture and technology, you know, we have, if we can't get the culture right and we can't build the trust within our colleagues and our leadership, um, then there are they're going to fail, they're going to fear failure to Jeff's point. And if they fear failure, then growth is hindered. Whether you're using technology, whether you're using face-to-face -face mentoring, whatever it is, if the culture is not there and the trust is not there, everything else falls down. Eddie, I'm gonna to go to you next. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's, uh... It, it's definitely about the culture uh, and creating that culture of learning and, and it, it is a, a challenge for, for all of us uh, some more acute than others as, as Jeff has pointed out in the uh, automotive services uh, industry as well TJ yeah and I'd echo the same I mean there's um I think there's a book that summarizes it all if you've not read Carol Dweck's book on on mindset growth versus fixed mindset um, the table stakes is learning is a part of life so uh, said directly, get over it. Like if you want to be the best version of you, you're going to learn, right? Whether it's personal, professional, spiritual, whatever, you, whatever path you pick. But to the, the culture point, I think is more about putting the responsibility on organizations to set employees up for success, pick the right technologies, embrace that for the right learning management partners, you know, figure out the subject matter experts that can amplify the scale um, and then set your employees on clear plans, build the right leadership around it, and then be patient. <laughs> like that's one thing we got to stop doing is be impatient on the actual journey. So I think this was really good. Julie, I loved a lot of your points. So thanks for sharing. Jeff, I'm going to give you the final word. 
Yeah, I, I one want to thank everybody for uh, joining us on this discussion today and, and, and thank my, my colleagues on the panel here. Uh, and I agree with everything everyone said in closing discussions. I'll just bring up one thing that we really haven't talked about and, and, and focus on the drivers behind the widening skill gap. It's, it's, it's technology in general the, you know, uh, that is driving the skill gap because it's automating more processes and it's changing what has to happen. And one thing we haven't brought up today is the emergence of artificial intelligence and uh, you know, it's really the next big thing that's going to happen. And like, I've been, this is going to be accounted at the third major technological revolution of my, my career. And, uh, like the prior two, um, you know, personal computing and the internet, um, at first it changes nothing and then everything changes all at once. Um, and so it's, it's just going to exacerbate the, the the skill the skilling problem and uh, and hopefully somewhere in there there's uh there's some solutions to it and companies like mine hope to help you guys with that um but uh but yeah as, as you heard from the other panelists it's like developing skills just takes time and you're going to start off and you're, you're not going to be good at it you know you're not you know eddie van halen didn't know how to it wasn't good when the first time he picked up a guitar you know uh like you just <laughs> this is that's the way it is, you know. That's that, that's us humans. We're not in the matrix yet. You can't just plug in and go. Oh, I know karate, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but th that's my closing. It's it it's it's accelerating, and and we're we're about to live through the next ten years is going to be a major uh, accelerant on uh, what's already been a very rapidly accelerating uh, gap. That's right. That's right. Well, I'm going to say a, a big thank you to all of you and for the audience as well. Could have talked about this for much longer. Julie, Jeff, TJ, Eddie, thank you. Thank you to everyone that joined today. We'll have a recording. This, if you have any follow-up questions, you know, please send it to us here at Brennan Hall Group. We'll get it to the team of experts. I know your days are super busy. We ran a couple minutes over. We always appreciate you joining with that Mindshare competition that you have called work out there. So we hope to see you soon and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Oh.